What if you're in charge of an investment firm and you have billions of dollars in your responsibility? Would you invest it in Tesla? How much would you invest? How do you know it's the right decision? So today we have Ross Gerber with us. He's a CEO and co-founder of Gerber Kawasaki. They are a wealth management firm and they manage $1.7 billion since their founding in 2010. So within that, they have a growth ETF and they allocate 12.5% in Tesla. So what an opportunity for us. We have an actual investment advisor with us, although as always, though, always, this is not investment advice, but he has a massive conviction in Tesla. So he is frequently on CNN, CNBC, Bloomberg, and now he's here with us. What a treat. So thank you very much. We're, he ha we have him here now. We can ask him all sorts of our investing questions. Welcome, Ross. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. By the way, I have a financial advisor, so technically this is financial advice or what we would call communications with the public. So whatever I talk about is not specific advice to you and it's not trading advice. And you should definitely do discuss with a financial advisor before you do anything in investments like Tesla involve lots of risk, even though there's lots of reward. So it's important for investors to understand um, the risks that they're taking when they're investing. And Tesla is great of an investment that I think it will be also has certain risks as well. Wonderful. Well, you know, you founded Gerber Kawasaki, so I definitely want to understand better your philosophy of your investment firm and, of course, the ETF and your allocation for Tesla. One of the things I was struck by you was that you are very similar to other financial advisors in many ways, but there's so many things that you do that's very different. You're only one that I know that has an ETF. You surprisingly don't just focus on the high net worth individual. You will focus on all sorts of individuals. I'm also surprised that you don't just focus on one specific theme. You cover all sorts of different themes and you're very good at selecting which ones you choose. So I want to deep dive dive in that. I want to get there. But first, I want to talk about Tesla as always. Yeah. That's my area of yeah. interest. So what Me made too. you build your conviction in Tesla? Did it take you some time or was it something that just happened one day and you realized this is big and it's going to be massive? Or did it take you a long time to really develop that conviction? Um, I think with investing, it's funny because I, I've been planting a lot of trees lately with my kids and <laughs> getting lots of holes in, in my yard. I bought my house finally thanks to interest right. rates and my landlord freaking out. And so I bought it finally. And I was planting trees the other day and I said to my kids, I said, this is so much about like what I do for a living. We plant seeds and hopefully they grow into these like small and then eventually these massive trees that produce fruit for us for the rest of our lives. And as an investment advisor, my job is to plant these seeds for clients, um, finding these great plants or companies to invest in. And then hopefully over their lifetime, we don't have to sell them. They grow and they produce fruit forever. And so when you think about investing in the future and having your tree grow, you want to obviously invest in the tree that's going to grow in the environment that you're in the best and the strongest. And, and so oftentimes each decade we find different themes to be dramatic drivers of wealth and prosperity and opportunity. And over the last three decades that I've been a professional investor, I started in 1994. Each decade has had very unique themes that I've been able to ride. So it's kind of like riding the surf or surfing where you want to get on a good wave and ride it as long as possible. And there are lots of waves that kind of come and are too small or not right. And you have to pass on those, even though they might be popular for short periods of time. And you have to look for the big wave and wait. And then you want to ride that big wave and catch it. And so... When we first found Tesla, it was actually eight years ago. So I actually don't even consider the wave had started yet. The wave is now here, you know. But like when we started with Tesla, basically, Tesla, you know, we're here in Santa Monica and Tesla's first store was here in Santa Monica. And so we saw these little roadsters and I kind of, you know, I love cars and it reminded me of the Lotus, which was what it was made like. And, you know, I'm driving my Aston Martins and my Maseratis and Porsches and, you know, I like high end cars. And so that car didn't appeal to me. Plus it had no range, whatever. And then Tesla came out with Model S and and they went public in, I think, 2013-ish. Um, and we watched it for 
a good year or two. People go, oh, Tesla's public. I go, oh, they don't have a product, you know, until they're selling the product, I don't want anything to do with it. So the Model S came out, I got in this Model S and looked at it and I said, if this is an electric car and it's as good as I think it could be, this is a game changer. Like it's as good as any other car, but it's electric, like when? Um, so we invested in Tesla, and, and fortunately, I was fairly aggressive at that time in that investment, and it immediately rallied from, at that time, $35 to $80, and it was like, wow, score, and I sold half my investment like an idiot. And um, well, I was up 5X or whatever, 4X, right, like in a year. So the adventure had just begun, but the vision of what Tesla was going to become had certainly, like, not... It wasn't relevant to me at that time because the 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 it was like a little bush that was growing and I was like, oh, it's a nice tree that we planted, but it's got a long way to go. And then the Model X came out and had all these problems. And then the Model 3 came. And when the Model 3 came, I was like, this is the game changer. Once they go to mass production, and I thought they would be successful pretty easily, which I was wrong. And um they had made two hard cars, so I thought the Model 3 would be easy. They get to production. They make 250,000 cars a year. Um, the company's profitable, and we all win. And that's when I realized when I got in the Model 3, I was one of the first owners of the Model 3. And when I got in the Model 3 and I came from a Maserati, I was like, I love this car. <laughs> it's fast. It's not that expensive. It was like <laughs> grand. I got this benefit from the government 7500 off so it cost me let's say $52,000 which i eventually sold that car for a profit i actually sold it for i think like 55 or 58,000 after having it for 3 or 4 years for a profit which i had tweeted and everybody made fun of me and attacked me many years before and now everybody who buys a tesla yeah. can sell it for a profit yeah. and everybody was like oh it's cuz of car shortages it's cuz of this and i said no it's because it's a Tesla and everybody wants one and you can save $5,000 a year on gas. And so the values of Teslas have risen over time. Now, so in, when Model 3 came out, I knew that this would be a successful vehicle if they could scale, but I wasn't sure they were going to succeed at scaling. Mm -hmm. Boy, that was the hardest period of time for me as a Tesla investor. So that's when I really saw the scale of it when I went to Fremont and met with Martin and I learned a lot about Tesla that day. I met with Jerome. I went with management. They opened the whole company to me. I said, I, mm -hmm. I can't, you know, keep investing in this company if I don't really meet everybody because I'm getting my butt kicked online and on TV. And, and that's when I saw the scale of what they were doing. And then I said, there's a big disconnect between what Tesla's trying to do and what the market's saying, what the haters are saying, and what the oil industry is trying to, you know, the FUD masters trying to put out. And I go, this could be the most consequential, like, vehicle yeah. of all time. And yeah. that's when we really doubled down, when Elon raised money, uh, because we were like, Elon, you need to raise money. And then he raised money, and it was like 2018 or 19, I think it was, 2019. And we put more money in then, and then the stock took off, and the rest is history. But truthfully, when I was in Austin in April, I had another Tesla epiphany of scale, hmm. That I, once again, I still think most people in the investment community don't fully see Elon's vision because it's too big for them. Mm -hmm. So I'm more bullish on Tesla today than I've ever been because they almost failed. You know, like back in the old days, it was a high, high, high mm -hmm. risk investment and we got a high, high reward because they succeeded. But now they got, let's say $20 billion on the books and they're profitable every quarter and they're killing it. So there's a risk reward relationship that's not as good anymore because we all know Tesla's great. Everybody knows Tesla's great now and the stock trades at let's say 75 times earnings, everybody in a, in a market at 17 times earnings. So everybody already knows Tesla's great. You know, okay, so, so really the, the outperformance comes is because I still think that they're underestimating the potential yeah. as great as Tesla is. And so, um, so I think the opportunity is better now than it was before, even though the returns will be lower than the last 10 years. I still think they'll be a very above average returns uh, and market beating returns over the next decade. Yeah. One of the uh, terms that you... Uh, coined, I think, is when you said that Tesla is one of the most consequential companies in the yeah. world. And when you did that, and one of these uh, news episode TV shows, I've been 
<laughs> repeating that over and over and over again, by the way, just so you know. Yeah, I, I have give a, you a attribution. Tutoring the enemies of America. That's, that's my new, new thing. So because tell me now, what you mean by that. What do you mean by the most consequential company in the world? Well, now it's definitely the most consequential company in the world. Not one of. Now it mm. is. So mm. two things have happened in the last, let's say, year that or two that have been massive paradigm shifts in the way the global world functions. And one was the effect of COVID on society and global trade in China. And then to the weaponization of commodities through the Ukrainian war. And these factors have now, um, I would say, pulled forward the opportunity for Tesla and made it the most consequential company in the world. And, and things like Starlink, like literally a game changer for Ukraine, like literally a game changer when you think about technology and how it can save lives and affect people in a positive manner. So when you think about climate, like Puerto Rico just got hit hard, you know, and it's nothing new, you know, like Puerto Rico is going to get hurt hard more and more and more. And the rain is pouring. And then we just had the hottest day in the history of Southern California. The other day, it was 103 on the beach in Santa Monica. I'd never seen it grown up here, lived here my whole life. I, I, I am severely concerned. I went to Malibu the other day. It's literally just brown waiting to burn, you know, and so climate action, we are past the point that even if we do everything now, we might not still save our society and our humanity. Like we're literally in a position, like humans are so dumb that we have literally are extincting ourselves like dinosaurs. And, and then it's like this battle between people like me who are pushing for the future and clean energy and people like Warren Buffett who are trying to make as much money as possible today at the expense of the environment. And it's fucking disgusting, man. <laughs> I mean, I hate to say it, but Buffett makes me want to puke. And I used to love him. You know, like I, I studied Buffett. Uh, you know, I invest a little bit like Buffett. I, I, I respected his success my whole career. But in the last five years, I've decided he's nothing but a soulless profiteer. He doesn't give a shit about anything. You know, he just doesn't. And he lives in a little house in Omaha, and he doesn't care if the world burns up because he's 95. So if he can make money making people fat and taking oil money from people, he's perfectly happy. And he's become the largest investor in Occidental Petroleum while he's selling off his BYD stake in EVs. It's like, you know, really? And then I'm reading the president of Armaco is so excited uh, that we need to invest so much more in the oil that we have an oil shortage and this is all your fault. And if we invest more in oil, this would have never happened. We need more oil. And people are like, Armaco, Armaco. And they're like, oh, by the way, if you say the wrong thing, we cut you into pieces. And we bombed, you know, America just 20 years ago. So hopefully, hopefully you'll send us billions and billions of dollars for no reason. I literally despise the oil producing countries of the world. Okay. So this is a war now. This is a war against Saudi Arabia, Russia, and Iran. That's what this is. And Tesla is our secret nuclear weapon against commodities war. And every day, Tesla gets stronger, and we don't need commodities any longer. And it's the best thing in the world. And so Tesla is the most important and consequential company in the world for making a difference and improving humanity, period. Yeah. Isn't it great, though? That it isn't wonderful? Isn't it unique that we can find a wonderful company because it hits our moral compass, because it hits the wonderful you know, benefits of the world, but at the same time, it so happens that it could actually be, and you might say it already is, one of the best investments anybody can ever have in generations. Oh, I mean, it has been so far, right? I mean, like after the split, I was looking at my cost basis and it's like $3, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, right. I'm like, yeah. did I really pay 250 for this $300 stock? You know, like the best investment of my career, you know, and granted my firm's success. And by the way, we're at like more like $2 billion in assets, but like, yeah. but my firm's success, a lot of it has been because of Tesla. So I'm not confused. We, we, you know, made our clients a couple hundred million dollars plus, you know, it was one of the greatest trades of all time. And it just is. Yeah. And that got us to where we are. And, and, you know, Apple was sort of my first big score and I rode, I'm still riding Apple, you know, but Tesla will be the rest of my career.
You, you, know? you and I are very similar, by the way. Um, I did uh, almost all in on Apple for decades, did yeah. that very well. Now I'm was... all in on Tesla. Yeah. And I made the very similar comment about Buffett uh, in a previous episode of mine. I feel the same way. I yeah. favor people who are creators, uh, products. Of course, too. You know, Mother is just an a hole, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, th let's get back to Tesla's investment. So when you look at Tesla's fundamentals, what are you looking at? Like what specifically is the metric that gets you most excited? Is it the, yeah, you know, is it the gross margins, right? Is it the, uh, the, the production numbers and the factories? What is it are you looking at to really give you that conviction? Is it the market potential? The fact that EVs is really, it's taken over and they're only at 2%. What's, what are you looking at? I think the most important thing that I'm looking at as far, you know, obviously they're profitable now, so we do have metrics and and we're able to see how their business has changed as scale has come into their business and their ability to control costs and reduce costs while increasing scale is really an interesting part of Tesla. A lot of people don't understand, but that was explained to me by Jerome Gillion early on in my experience about learning how to build electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. You know, I, 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 when I, you know, as an investor, I never really liked going to factories and things like that mm. in the old days because i was just like it's a waste yeah. of time you know it's like yeah. i'm investing in your company and i'm looking at financials and i'm learning about your company but walking around looking at machines and i've looked at more factories and things in the last year or two than i've ever seen and i've learned so much because i i, I took it upon myself to learn how to build batteries and evs mm. you know not that I can physically build it, right. but I, I've seen more. I've seen all the companies. I, I've I've yet to go to Rivian. I want to go see Rivian, hmm. but I, you know, I've, I I know a lot about this now, and and I'm still learning. And I've got great teachers. Like you know, I I've been I've had access to some of the smartest people in uh, lithium industry, battery industry, uh, EV industry, and I've learned a heck. Of a lot, but one of the things that I think most people don't understand about Tesla is it's super inefficient company in its core because it's focused on innovation. So the idea is we're not going to worry about costs because we want to make something amazing, and then once we make it amazing, we need to scale it, and then we'll worry about costs. And that's how Tesla sort of functions. So when Model Three came out, everybody thought they would go bankrupt because if you actually looked at margins and everything, they were pretty bad. But they weren't taking into account scale. And what Elon has done, which most people don't understand, is he went out to lithium guys and he went out to battery suppliers and he said, "I need enough cells for the next decade." Mm. I want to buy them all now. And they were like, we don't sell like that. We sell every year, you know, like do a short term contract. And Elon said, no, I want 10 year contracts. I want guaranteed supply and I will pay you money right now. And this was before Ford and before everybody else decided to make EVs. Now, I was reading this wonderful article about how uh, cautious Ford and GM were getting into the EV business. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. now they can't scale because they didn't like secure supplies to make a lot of EVs. They thought they'd make 50,000 and placate the market, which is exactly what I thought they were going to do. And they made 50,000. The market said, we want 500,000. And they go, oh, OK, we need factories. We need lithium. We need cells. Mm -hmm. And now they're rushing to do all this at the same time as everybody else. OK, Tesla's got it all secured. So what you saw with Ford last night is they said, we can't finish 45,000 cars. It's going to cost us an extra billion. We're bad at making cars. Now, the big insult mm -hmm. to Tesla was you don't know how to make a car. Right. And now it's the opposite, right? Like Ford doesn't know how to make a car. They can't make these cars. They can't deal with supply <laughs> chain. And Tesla can because they had that foresight. So one of the most important metrics when you're looking at Tesla is as they've scaled, they've actually lowered their cost per vehicle Yeah, because scale works to their advantage because they were planning for scale. So that's, I think, an interesting thing about Tesla that people don't realize is that now we're starting two new plants. And they're in the costly stage of making 1,000 cars a week to get to 5,000 cars a week where they can break even. And because these are bigger, more complicated factories, they really need to get to, you know, maybe 10,000 cars a week to really be profitable. And so as they now scale these facilities, this should be a very interesting time for Tesla in the next six months to a year to see how their costs and production and margins work as they now double production again. So we're going to go from 2 million cars or so 
or a million five cars to close to three million cars, I think, in a year. You know, so 12 months from now, the next year's run rate should be three million cars. The current run rate should be close to two million plus cars, like over the next 12 months. So you're talking about a company that's like growing exponentially, let's say 40, 50 percent, you know, vehicle production growth right now, but not losing margin. And that's what's incredible. And if they can do that over the next year, Oh my God, how much money are they going to make? You know, yeah. They're 70% of the EV market. So, yeah, there is a bit of a disconnect that I need to, you answer for me. Okay. Because it's, we, we are, we've just talked about this and you, I can hear it in your voice. You believe strongly in the conviction of the fundamentals of Tesla. Why is it then that people like you and Kathy Wood and others would invest in other electric vehicle companies or adjacents. So we just heard that Kathy Wood just put in another, I don't know, 5 million shares of GM this morning. GM? GM. She, she's lost her mind. I, I don't understand. She invested in GM. I don't understand. It just blows my mind. And then, but you guys also invest in Arkimoto, which I think you just, re, you, you, you've, you've t t taken out of that. But you yeah. seem to also you know, invest in other EVs. So clearly yes. electric vehicle is a massive yeah. market. It's going to grow. There's going to be a lot of players. But if you see a player like, you know, Tesla, that's so dominating, yet you still dabble in other areas. Why is that? Well, because the market's going to grow exponentially and there's not, per se, other Teslas, but there's Tesla brothers and sisters being born all over the place, two of which I love, which are Polestar right. and you know, and Rivian, and mm -hmm. they each have different challenges and different advantages, but the, but it's really about valuation. So mm -hmm. Polestar trades at $15 billion, Tesla trades at a trillion dollars. So I, Polestar is about to make 50,000 cars. Okay. Annually and go to a hundred thousand cars and then go to 150,000 cars and then go to 250,000 cars over the next five years. So they can grow five X. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So if I can buy a stock for $7 yeah, today or $15 billion, you know, that's really probably worth closer to $30 billion anyways. Like there's a 2x right there just getting to like pure valuation. And then if they succeed over the next five years, I think it's a $50 stock. So it's like there's a 5x return in a Polestar. And, and Rivian has different economics, but... I love the truck business. I think the truck business is the next big thing for EVs. And I want to be in the truck business. And I don't think Ford can scale. And I mm -hmm. think Rivian is learning hard, the hard way. But I, I, I have a small investment in Rivian because I think the product's amazing. And I think everybody wants it. And they built a great brand. And they're backed by Amazon. And so I think they're going to be successful. I, I think Polestar is probably a better investment than Rivian from the fundamentals perspective. It's a wonderfully run company with wonderful products. But I think once Rivian gets their costs and designs under control, I think they'll sell as many trucks as they make. So my basic premise right now is anybody who can make a great EV will sell the car. And so if they can make the EV and they can do it in scale, there are three, four, five X potential returns in these companies. See, with Tesla, I've made 100 X. 100x. Okay, so if I double my money, so like, like I was thinking about this. So what's Tesla worth today? So now with the split, post split, we're looking at four dollars of earnings for this year. Okay, so you could do 100 times earnings, or you could do 50 times earnings. It's an arbitrary number depending on what you think about Tesla, right? So you got a range of 200 to 400, and you got the stock at 300 right in the middle of that range, right? But that's this year's earnings. The question is, what's next year's earnings? Now we got a lot of boogeymen because Jerome Powell's trying to destroy the economy. But assuming he doesn't destroy the economy, people are still going to buy EVs because it's an inflation killer, right? So I can kill my cost of living by five thousand dollars by buying an EV annually. So you know they're going to buy EVs recession or not. It doesn't matter. It cuts inflation. And so the way I look at it is maybe they do $7 next year. If they go from 4 to $7. Now, no, there's some people more like at $6, but maybe they're too conservative as they all are all the time. But if they do $7 and you do 50 times that, you're at 350. So so Tesla's worth uh, at least 10% more than where it's trading at today in my mind. But that's not doubling. You see what I'm saying? 
Where, where I think Polestar could yeah. should be worth twice as much as where it is right now. Right. And Rivian, yeah. So there's a 2x return in these EV players right off the bat versus Tesla. I see a 15% upside right now. Now, over the next decade, mm -hmm. I expect Tesla to do the 20 to 30% a year average, not hundreds and hundreds of percent like we saw over the last de decade, you know, and that's just because it's at a trillion dollars. You know, so my ultimate market value for for Tesla over the next couple of years is several trillion dollars, probably the biggest company in the world. And you can still make two, three, four X on Tesla. Don't don't get me wrong. But part of the game is finding the next big winner. And there are many discounts in the market today. Remember, Rivian went public at 70 bucks. Now it's at 38, you know, and it got 18 billion of cash on the books. So it's like you're basically getting the business for cheap. You know, and we know they're going to burn through most of that cash over the next three years, but they've got it. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So they're not going to dilute. And then you've got Polestar, which does need some cash over the next couple of years, but they've got Volvo. So it's like they're not yeah. going anywhere. Yeah. And so my and then I bought some BYD because they're the most uh, you know, successful company in China for EVs and battery, and they have great battery tech and a great yeah. supply chain. So if you invest in my fund, you now own four of the best EV makers in the world, led by Tesla at a 12% allocation. I got Polestar under 2%. I'm trying to get Rivian up to about a 1% allocation. And then I've got a BYD, which is less than a 1% allocation because China's a mess. But yeah. I will increase yeah. 1% when China ends their no COVID policy. So, um, so I want to own EVs. That's the way I look at the world. So in China, I think sales recently was 30% of new cars were EVs, and their goal was 20%. Now, Chinese people are very smart and economical. So an EV to a Chinese person is like a no-brainer. Yeah. You know, it's like eating it up. Yeah. We love tech. Why would we spend more money? We like saving money. Americans are like, Oh, we like big trucks. We'll spend tons of money on gas. I don't care if it's an obsolete truck. I I look cool, you know. And that's why I like the truck business because we did some research on truck people, you know, like Americana, Texas truck people. Will they buy an EV? And it turns out they love EVs too. So when Ford made their EV, it was the best gift they could have given to Tesla because it made EVs cool for the Ford F-150 uh, class and those people love the the truck too, so yeah. the sort of macho male, you know, construction type guy likes an EV, and that's what I was worried about. It would be like too like you know goody two shoesy, too uh, west coasty, you know. Yeah. It wouldn't be like yeah. manly enough, you know. But that's yeah. not been the case in in what we've seen. So I think the truck business is going to be amazing, and I want to be in it, and I can't wait yeah. for cyber. Yeah. Okay. So now I understand a little bit where you're saying it's about time frames, and um, you're looking at the EV market and you're looking for the one second 5X, 10X from here. Although well, just, if, how, you yeah. know how many cars are sold a year? Uh, it depends on which market, right? So the you know, US market, like 10 million a year. And, no, yeah. It's like 15 million. The world, 15 million, million yeah. US, and then it's like yeah. twice as many in, in right. China. And then it's yeah. about the same in EU, a little less. So you're yeah. looking at, let's say, 70 or 80 million cars a year. Right. And right now, it's like we're selling less than 5% or EVs. So right. if you extrapolate out that that number is going to get to like 25 to 50%, like everybody's EVs yeah. is going to win. Yeah, everybody's going to win. Okay, so it's a difference between time frames, although just – to let it out there, I'm an all, I'm an all in and Tesla, and the reason I am is that I still see it doing the doubles, the five x and a ten x. It's about time frame, and yeah, to me, to it's about the risk, right? It's like there there's very little risk today. It was huge, massive risk when I was investing in 2012, yeah. 2018, yeah. 2020. Now we're here, where we've got four factories humming, we've got energy bots, all of that. So it's actually less risk than these other ones that you're Absolutely. talking about. Who knows? So it's a matter of what you want to put in. And maybe you should put in a little bit on these on these as well. Well, that's what, what my fund does. Yes. So it's like, like Tesla's the largest holding my fund, so I don't disagree yeah. with your premise. It's my largest personal holding by a ton. And, you yeah. know, so I don't disagree with your premise. But I also, you know, I'm trying to make money not just off Tesla, too, because yeah. Elon Musk could get hit by a bus. So it's sure. just, you know... I mean, that's happened. It happened to my biggest, most important stock of my life, Apple. 
Because Steve Jobs wouldn't go to the doctor and get his toe taken Yeah, off. but that didn't do anything. In fact, as we know, Tim oh, Cook yeah, made it yeah. 10, 15, 20 yeah. X from where it was. So I think that that's where Tesla is, by the way. I think that even if Elon, something happened to him, there's nothing's going to stop his runaway train at this point. It's going to be like Apple. I See, I disagree. I, mm. I, I don't think they have. Elon does not have a Tim Cook. Mm. And Tim Cook was groomed for years by Jobs and then handed off this beautiful plate of products that he invented to run with for the next decade, okay? Now, I don't think Tesla's there yet. I think Tesla might be there in the next couple of years, but I think this is still a crucially important period of time for Elon. And, you know, I just worry a little bit about him because he doesn't work out and he threatens warlords, yeah. and, you know, <laughs> and he's Shit. a big single threat to the oil producing nations of the world. Yeah. He is the single greatest threat. So, so let's not yeah. underestimate the, mm. the national security importance of a guy like Elon, not to mention SpaceX is the largest launcher of military satellites for the United States and Israel. So when you really actually think about Elon's strategic importance to the United States, yeah. he's actually added a decent amount of risk, you yeah. know? And, and so, and I don't think he fully gets that to be honest, because I've hmm. dealt with him plenty and his security is good, but not if I was as good as if I was him, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, Cause I think he likes, you know, sort of pressing the flesh with everybody all the time. Um, so that is a legitimate risk and, and a reason to diversify. That said, I, I think he'll be fine. And 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 but I but I do think that there are so much opportunity in the entire opportunity that investors, that's what I've done in my fund, is I built this 25% position in EV and climate investments led by Tesla, which is half of that. Let's say 12 and a half percent is just Tesla. And the other 12 and a half percent are all the other opportunities in the climate trade. That's how my, yeah. my fund works. Yeah. One of the things that you said at the, um, what is it, the uh, the Cyber Rodeo, and you were presenting at the Silicon uh, camera, yeah, the Austin yeah, one. One of the things you said was, and again, another one that I've been stealing from you without <laughs> giving you attribution, <laughs> is when you said, and, I, and I've been following this, and that's why I repeat it, it's because I already believed this even before you said it, which is the when they say the factory is the product, and people are not giving that enough um, kind of like below, understanding what they mean by that. And what I hear as a product manager is that they're not going to just build one factory, two factories, four factories. They're going to build eight. They're going to build 16 and onward. Um, and you were the one, I think, that said that at that time. So what's your expectations for the, the factories that they're building and how many are they going to do and what's going to happen with the master plan part three? So. So they just have, you know, two huge investments, like in crucial stages right now. So it's kind of like, you can't start a new battery, uh, a new uh, gigafactory, until you sort of get all those things working in the two, you know, they've done one at a time. So, you know, it was like, Fremont is like a Lego set. It's yeah. like, everything's placed where it, it just was, you know, and like, it's super inefficient. Like, you know, they make the batteries in Nevada and put them on a truck and drive four hours to Fremont and then assemble them and then ship all those cars out all over the country, right? And they used to ship them to Europe and stuff, which now they get the Chinese versions. So then when China opened, it was kind of Jerome's project to make this thing way better than what Elon and that guy Fields had done before. And so that's why you're seeing just amazing results out of China, not only because of the work ethic and certainly the, the innovation of the Chinese people, but also just the efficiency of building the factory right. So, so China was actually the first factory that was built the way it's supposed to be. And mm -hmm. now they're getting up to a million cars a year in this thing. And I'm like, wow, you know, this thing is so profitable, right? And so now you're ramping two factories at the same time. And it wasn't supposed to be that way. It was like, because of delays, like mm. it was supposed to be a little bit staggered. And then it was like, oh, by the way, we're opening both at the same time. So you got like your two teams now trying to scale battery production as well, because they put it all in the same place, as well as vehicle production in two locations on different sides of the earth. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot, you know, that's a lot. And so now they're looking at new sites, you know, they've been rumors, you know, I think India makes sense. Uh, they're talking about Canada, which makes sense from a resource uh, perspective because low cost of energy um, in building stuff. 
Um, I think Latin America makes sense, like Brazil. You know, we want to be in Latin America, and Tesla has no factories in Latin America. So Brazil is a country that I think would do real, Tesla would do really well in and has a good manufacturing and car base uh, and lots of commodities and access to commodities. And he was just in South America, in Argentina, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so when you think that each gigafactory max is out close to a million cars, that would be ideal. Right now we got four, so the maximum capacity, I think currently is probably three million plus cars. And then like, so if, so I think soon we'll see the announcement for one or two more because they've got to start the site and the process now to be up and running in a few years, which then gives those other factories enough time to get to uh, break even. So I'm expecting probably two new Gigafactory announcements mm -hmm. soon as well as continued expansion in, in Texas and China because um, I do think they're going to double the size of Texas again. Like, I think it's going to be massive in Texas. So so the growth never ends, and, and, and they've got these factories down, and, and they are just got to deal with the politics and logistics of building new factories. But they they got to build, like, six more, right, right off the bat to get to yeah. 10 cars, you know? When I heard uh, Elon talk about Master Plan Part 3, and he's talking about massive scale, and you look to the kind of tweets he's been making or explanation of what it is, it's sounding very global. It's sounding very, very comprehensive beyond just cars. And then, of course, now we've heard that in the Texas uh, Bay, they're going to do refining of lithium. Yeah. It feels like to me that maybe next year it's going to be when Tesla Energy is going to be a major focus and they're going to start building more batteries, not just for the cars, but, um, you know, just starting to build. Uh -huh. Everything I well. So at, at this point, Tesla Energy is not even a blip, right? In your calculations, do you have it as something? Or are you someone who just kind of like, I'll wait until that product actually starts to build before we'll factor it into yeah. our estimates? So my whole, <laughs> it's funny because there's so many analysts that really do great work on Tesla, like Gary Black and, yeah. and Pierre and all these guys, I, Dan Ives. You know, I, 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 I like these guys, and I, I read all their work, and it saves me a lot of time. And I go on the Bloomberg terminal, and it shows me every stat I could ever look at. You know, um, I don't value any of those businesses when I start looking at numbers, not because they're not valuable, just because what do I quantify it at? It could be a huge number, right? Yeah. So... You know, they call it the Inflation Reduction Act, but it was really the Tesla Benefit Act. And the <laughs> yeah. Tesla Benefit Act of Biden was some ironic, ironic yeah. where you tried to help <laughs> GM and Ford and he ended right. up in Tesla. <laughs> because I don't think he understood Tesla was the only guy making batteries in the United States. And Tesla is a master at work in the government. You know, and mm. so building batteries in the United States is all of a sudden a lucrative business because you're getting a subsidy to build the battery and then you're going to get an EV credit to sell the car. Yeah. It's a huge win for Tesla. Yeah. Huge win. The Tesla Enrichment Act, I think, is what I've been called. <laughs> you can steal that one too. So I will. We <laughs> created the Tesla Enrichment Act. And we we're trying to figure out how much like cost saving we're going to get from this, and it's enormous. So the next big thing for Tesla, if they can supply the cells, is making them here and and then making battery packs for utilities. So like in California, but most so I'm not an expert in this because I hate utilities and it's, it's <laughs> yeah, like I gotcha. boring. Yeah. Years. These are like the worst run things in the world, right? Like department of water and power and all this kind of stuff. And the waste is enormous and the lack of investment is ridiculous. And the energy grid yeah. is, I mean, don't get me started. So <laughs> Californian, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the basic idea <laughs> is that like, I just bought my house and I'm going to rebuild it. I'm going to have to tear yeah. it down at some point, and rebuild it. And it's real old. And the roof is real old. So it's like when I rebuild this house, what am I going to do? Well, you'd be dumb not to make the house completely self-sufficient, which you can do now. So I'm going to get off the grid. I'm going to buy Tesla Solar or, or Solar from SunPower or whoever. I'm going to buy a battery system for my house. I've already got two Teslas. I'm going to get electric. You, you know, in California, you have to get like electric ovens now and electric heat pumps. And, and now there's all these incentives to do these electric heat pumps in your house and insulation. And, and essentially, 
the government's going to give you credits for, I think it's 20 to 30% of the cost of these things. And then you, and then you get Starlink, so you're not completely beholden to wire connected to your house, which I am. And then I don't have cell coverage at my house because I'm down. It, it doesn't make sense. But I don't have cell coverage, so I completely rely on. But I live in a wooded area, so every time a tree branch falls, it cuts my internet, and it's like I can't call, I can't do. I'm like in the Stone Age, right? And so I'm going to get Starlink. So essentially, what Tesla is creating is a world where no matter where you live in the world, you could have full energy and internet access without needing a utility. So you become your own utility. And that's basically what they're doing in Texas, because Texas has super unreliable energy. And Tesla realized that first day. And they're like, we need to become a utility, which I think they applied they to. Yeah, they did. They got approved for it. Yeah. And then they can put up solar power themselves, put up a mega pack, back up the, the Austin factory and back up the whole city, probably. And Elon said it many times. If you use solar and batteries, we could power this entire country for less than the size yeah. of Texas. You know, I have a prediction, by the way, that, you know, he's talked about just needing. Sorry. Sorry. No, yeah, just uh, the upside to that is unlimited. I just don't factor that in. Yeah, I yeah. have a prediction that I he's met, met, mentions a few times now that it just takes 100 square miles to be able to power the entire right. world. I think it's part of Massive Plan 3. They might just announce that he's going to, you know, take a huge chunk of Texas or some land somewhere. But I think it's going to be Texas. Well, and they're gonna just do that. solar. That's not yeah. a new idea. That's Next Era Energy. That's also in my fund. So Next yeah. Era Energy is one of the biggest renewable energy providers in the world. And their main market is actually Texas. They do a lot of wind in Texas, but they've taken huge pieces of land in Texas. Access to build hmm. solar and wind, and yeah. and people are doing this, and we all know it's so. Solar is more profitable now than natural yeah. gas or other forms of energy. Right, There's actually, no reason to build these plants anymore. So what yeah. they all say, so the oil industry says, well, we, you know, it's unreliable. This, you know, all this renewable energy, it's unreliable because. Yeah not sunny at night and and that's what the batteries solves and so this is the next big thing for tesla massive mega battery packs all over for every utility in a hot area for example of the world exciting so what what are you so you uh, when T ai day comes in a week from now week and a half from now 10 days from now are you excited for it is there anything there that you think is going to actually be a catalyst for the stock at all or What's your what's your perspective? And what, what happens if you see a demo of a bot? Yeah, they're yeah. going to demo stuff. What this is about is hiring. It's a recruiting right. thing. Yeah. So Tesla has the smartest people in the world working on AI and robotics. And Tesla's pivoting into AI and robotics a lot more because they've mastered making EVs. You know, like that's not a challenge for Elon. Elon needs the hardest challenges. He doesn't mm. thrive on just sitting back and enjoying his success, yeah, <laughs> you know? And so like in his mind, Tesla has come far enough along that it's probably not exciting for him to go out and find, you know, gigafactory sites, you know, but what's exciting is what's next with robotics and solving the problems that he faces in manufacturing vehicles, which is labor shortages, for example, and building better robots for manufacturing. I was just reading this, a big issue in China now too. China's working really hard on robots because there's just labor shortages for lots of jobs in manufacturing. And, and many of these jobs suck or are dangerous or, or, or super time consuming and, 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 you know, so there's lots of room for AI and robotics to grow over the next decade from where we are today, which is like level zero, you know. And so that's what I expect AI to really be about is to recruit the next generation of mm -hmm. AI and robotics engineers so that Tesla can seed its future with the brightest minds. And that's the way it works in innovation. So innovation is an interesting concept when you corporatize it. Mm -hmm. And if you go back historically, one of the most successful things that ever happened was this thing, I think it was called Hewlett Packard Park. And this was back mm -hmm. in like 60s and 70s, right. I think it was. Yeah. And guys used to like smoke weed and do acid and come up with computer chips and things like that. They don't yeah. talk about it, but if you look at the original picture of Microsoft from 1978, <laughs> they're a bunch of hippie deadheads who were stoned the whole time. And, 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 and people don't want to admit that the cross current of LSD mm -hmm. in Berkeley, computer chips, technology guys, Grateful Dead, there's a connection here with the innovation <laughs> that like exploded. Exploded, yeah. Okay. 
And Tesla creates an environment where innovation can happen, like that Hewlett Packard Park. And you get mm -hmm. these like really smart people and you like don't give them limitations and you like deal with their weird oddities, but you create mm -hmm. this incredible environment of intellect. And very few companies have that. So, so Tesla's true value actually isn't per se pumping out cars. It's yeah. the IP of the brains they attract. So that's what AI is about, AI day. And, and, and that's why I'm not going. You know, I wasn't invited per se. I was like, should I go to this? And they're like, are you, do you want to work at Tesla? I was like, yeah. <laughs> that's right. That's right. No, I agree no, with you. Yeah. And uh, no, so what I expect is we will see whiz bang things and lots of visions of the future because they're, they're trying to excite the next generation of young uh, entrepreneurs and engineers to join Tesla instead of joining boring Google where you're going to innovate nothing, you know? Yeah. yeah, I agree with you. I'm not, I, I think that these are, uh, you know, great products might be announced and demoed, but very f li unlikely that they're actual catalysts. Well, they, told for me, they told me that it's a recruiting day. You know, it's like, yeah. I'm like, should I fly the, there? I'm like, no. The you one know. thing, of course, is different is the bot, because this isn't just any product. <laughs> this is the product that well, could change the entire world. And so watching it develop and in, in its infancy and where it's going to go, it's going to be very, very exciting. Well, I like the C3PO. I do. <laughs> and... It, it are you know it already exists in Star Wars. It's just not as pretty as the bot that Elon made. I don't think that's going to be the real bot, personally. No, it's not. It's not. No. Yeah, and I think that's a. I think it's. I think he's one of the best salespeople I've ever known, Elon. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. In this genius of engineering, and he's also a sales guy. You know. Well, okay. So, so, robotics, and yeah. everybody got excited, and everybody talked about it, and everybody wanted one to like clean their house immediately. But I was like, dude, these robots are going to be like hammering things. You know, it's like, come on. Right, right, right. No, it's true that what we've seen so far are not going to be what uh, he's going to do. But it's also right. true that whenever Tesla demos something, a prototype, it is as close to the actual product in the f in that they actually deliver. So, that's you know, true. Unless, unless there's some difference in this scenario where they're not just to, you know, blow something up and then completely change it later. I don't, you know, don't who know. knows, you know, yeah. this is the fun. You know, when I invested in that, <laughs> all they had was an iPod, you know, yeah, yeah. I was watching it a was huge fun. iPad last night, you know, House yeah. of Dragons on his TV size iPad last night. Yeah. I'm like, I never thought this would happen, you know, it's like, that's I don't know. So that's the part of Tesla that I love. It's the yeah. part we don't know, yeah. but it's, it's going to be something. We just don't know. They're going to invent really cool stuff. Like really uh, cool. Yeah. Tell me more about Gerber Kawasaki and your investment philosophy. Um, and so, you know, when people are all in on Tesla mm -hmm. as an ad investment advisor and you're running uh, not only high net worth individuals, but other folks, uh, they can, you know, invest the money with you. You'll manage it properly. What's your thinking about, you know, the concept of being all in on Tesla uh, versus trying to spread it out in your ETF. At least your ETF is a multi-thematic, but you've picked right. companies that are high growth specifically. So it's not, uh, it's, it's, and it's heavily weighted on Tesla, but what's yeah, your, but like gambling too. you know, gambling is yeah. a great business too. <laughs> That's oh, yeah. You should, you should always have a piece of it, right? That's gambling. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Vegas, come on. Yeah. So, yeah. Almost as good as Tesla, but not quite. <laughs> sure. Yeah, um, right. No. So, Gerber Kawasaki, you're absolutely right. We, I did not start this firm to make the rich richer. Uh, we work with high net worth individuals, and it's not that I have anything against that. But in my industry, you have a, you know, there's probably about 75,000 independent financial advisors, and there's about 400,000 stockbrokers who are salespeople for big wirehouses. And many of the high net worth people, you know, work with these salespeople for whatever reason. And, you know, it's a nice business to try to pick them off, but the salespeople work all day long to, to keep you from doing that. So when I was a kid, I was mm -hmm. a hippie deadhead. So like, to me, the idea of investing was like, put all the information out there. That's why I put it all out there and help people invest. And if I give it all away, then maybe they'll come work with me and I'll help them build their financial plan. And, and what the hell will I care? They know what stocks I'm buying and selling or what are they going to do? Try to trade like me. Good luck. You know, mm -hmm. I watched football players last night, but trust me, I can't throw the football like mm -hmm. these guys. So I watched it for hours. Mm -hmm. I try, 
<laughs> you know, so investing isn't really the thing for most people because there's a, a tremendous amount of emotional pain and pleasure involved mm -hmm. with investing. And you have to actually go exactly opposite of your emotional feelings. And that isn't suited for most people. I am only suited for it because it is genetic. I, I, I have some ability to absorb enormous levels of risk and pain without mm -hmm. I, I have the emotion, I guess, but but I'm divorced from it. So like I can lose fifty million dollars in a day and I go yeah. home and that's that, you know. <laughs> Although this year's been stressful. Um and we're down hundreds of millions and right now and it's stressful. I but get past that. But I own great companies. So it's just like I gotta tell people, I gotta listen, you gotta buy more. I'm sorry. You know, like if you want me to tell you the world's coming to an end, it's not coming to an end. You know, mm -hmm. Jerome Powell is going to end the world. I'm sorry. So at Gerber Kawasaki, what what I, my goal was is to help as many people as possible build a financial plan. So we have really three programs. We have our Get Invested program, which we call Wealth Building. So if you're like young and you've never invested or right. you're on Robin Hood and you have 12 grand and you really yeah. actually want to do this right, that's the best time to get started. So best, I yeah. know from my own personal life, I started investing when I was 13. Mm -hmm. in the stock market. And I became a professional investor at 24 or, or 23. And so I learned that lesson from my parents, fortunately, that you should invest at a young age. And that's the secret to my wealth. I've been lucky. I've, I've invested in Apple and Tesla, and I've had above average return, and I'm much wealthier than average. But you don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be lucky. You can call me lucky. That's fine. You can just buy the S&P. But mm -hmm. if you start still at do well. 23, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I'm... I can't say guaranteed, but I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure I can make you a multimillionaire by the time you're my age. That's okay. Right. So now that I'm my age, which is over 50, which is extremely painful to admit, despite my youthful <laughs> desire. And Me <belief>. too. <laughs> but I'm, I'm kind of stoked about it because I, I have all this experience now, you know, like 30 years of experience investing. So when somebody's like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. I was like, really? How long have you been doing this? Because I've been doing it for 30 years. And and I know the secret is starting young. So that's part of my firm. So I would rather start with you when you have $10,000 nice. and you get your first job and you're, yep. and you're working at Microsoft or whatever you're doing and, and you're trying to get your life together and then you meet your, your ideal mate and now you want to put your financial plan, you need insurance, you're, you got ta we started a tax and accounting firm, so we're doing taxes now. Okay. Wow. Um, help you get your life in order. That's that's yeah. the first program. Get invested. So it doesn't matter how much money you have. Who cares? We're going to get you started because we know if we're going to have high net worth clients in the future, we got to mm. start them now, right? Mm. Secondly, we have what we call wealth management, and these are for people who have a little bit more money. Let's say two, three, four hundred thousand to about two to three million, where they're still accumulating. They're typically between thirty and sixty, but they need to accumulate and invest right. But now they have more assets, and it's a little bit more challenging for them, or they're scared of the risk levels. And we want to take advantage of all the retirement plans and tax advantages. So working at Gerber Kawasaki, one of the things we focus on is how do we take advantage of, for example, all the tax saving opportunities that exist in retirement plans, like your Roth IRA or a traditional 401k, for example, or through charitable giving or other tax strategies, tax loss harvesting, unfortunately, this year. All right. Yeah. And then we have high net worth for when you have three million or above. And a lot of these clients are tech employees, founders that right. are now like my age. And they started at, let's say, Riot Games or at which is now Tencent, you know, and they started 10 years ago or 15 years ago and they get their stock and their options and their pay. And now they have a few million bucks, you know, and they decide to move to Google and they have lots of questions. And they got rollovers. So that's our high net worth program. They have private stock and, and maybe Instacart and now Instacart's going public. That's mm -hmm. really what we're good at. What our specialty is working with people typically around 40 to 60 from the high net worth. So we don't really work with the 70 plus people as much. I do because I've been around for a long time. So my clients have gotten older, but you know, yeah. but we don't market to 70 plus year old wealthy people. That's not our firm. We don't 
I personally don't care about those people at all. Not, not no offense to those people, no, no, but yeah, they should be as yeah. a business strategy. It's not my strategy to worry about them. So the ideal market for us is, you know, somebody who's in that middle area of their life who really wants to get to a point where they have financial independence and the certainty of reaching them. And that's what we do at Gerber Kawasaki is we build your financial plan. We create certainty in your plan. And then the second side of that is investment management, making great investments for you. And that's why we started the ETF. So whether you're working with us or not, there's a lot of do-it-yourselfers who certainly can try to do it on their own, which yeah. is fine. But now you can get access to our investment management so, through our yeah. ETF. So the well, ETF yeah. is the growth section of our overall portfolio. And I have to explain this to people. So like, an ideal portfolio for me for a smaller client might be 30 to 40% my ETF, 30 to 40% the S&P 500, and mm, okay. maybe 20 to 30% bonds of some sort. You know, yeah. so mixing my fund with the S and P is a great way to do it because the S and P is not really a growth index. You know, it's sort of the market, but it's done very well over time. And then you can invest, especially now. Our fund is super cheap, and you can get all these great growth names for cheap right now. And when Jerome Powell is done killing the economy, yeah. growth <laughs> will take off. Sure, you know, and yeah. that's it's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's going to happen. Yeah. So. So that's, to me, the ideal way to play our portfolio is you own, you know, S&P or whatever, a broader index. So we call it index plus alpha, which is your extra right. return you get in the Teslas and the MGMs and the Apples. And that's what our fund does. It's about 44 stocks right now. It's usually around 40 to 45 stocks. And they're all the names I'm most confident in their growth and yeah. their it's pure growth fund. How do you know and how do you decide uh, every day we watch the ETFs and they decide if they're going right. to shed a stock or they're going to add a stock or how do you make those daily moves? Is there some sort of macro decision or just you're balancing it out or what's what, what goes in your head every time? Like do you it, it seems to me that with Tesla, you happen to just keep accumulating, right? Or are you oh, no. playing I mean it? If people acquire the fund, it accumulates more share of Tesla in proportion to the 12.5%. Yeah. Um, we can't accumulate more shares of Tesla because it's over 10% of the fund, and we're sort of trying to keep it still yeah. be a divert. It's not technically, it's a non diversified fund, technically. So I could, uh, but I originally I put that I wasn't going to put 10% in any one stock, and that's right. sort of a risk management thing. And so I've let it run. You know, because I don't want to sell any because I don't, you know, you know, but a lot of the trades we do are remember, we manage to like an allocation. So let's say I want NVIDIA to be a 3% allocation. It's at 3.1. I might sell a little NVIDIA just to get it to the allocation. It doesn't mean I don't like NVIDIA. Yeah, there you go. That's you know, what we need to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just the same, we might buy a stock to get it up to an allocation. So, so firstly, I decide like what macro wise allocation do I want to these sectors, you know, like climate, technology, healthcare and biotech, uh, real estate, and then the consumer. So that's kind of the sectors we we work in, you know, and so like, how much do I want in each sector? Okay. So like con the consumers kind of beat up right now because higher gas and food prices. So maybe it's a tougher sector, but there's values in the consumer right now, you know, like Nike, for example, you know, so like, Nike's as cheap as I've seen in a long time, has gone anywhere, you know, you know, so, but do I want to add to it today? Probably not because Powell's still destroying the consumer, you yeah. know, but on the other hand, we're seeing rallies in climate related stocks. We've got this new Tesla enhancement bill. And so it's like, I've been adding to uh, that area, but also I've been adding to like on semiconductor in chips because we love the chip business. And we also have the chip enhancement act too, but like, but like chips are beaten up, you know, so we like technology right now because it's really beaten up. So we look at valuations and growth rates. So we call it the peg ratio. So the stocks that we really want to add to are the ones that have the lowest PE to growth rate. Mm -hmm. So in Tesla case, the PE to growth rate is correct. It's like one, you know, so if I buy Tesla, I'm not a genius, but I'm not an idiot either. You know what I mean? I'm not overpaying. It's probably a little bit too cheap but not too expensive. But when I look at companies with very low price earnings ratio, like on semiconductor that have good growth rates, so it's got a 15 PE, but it's growing at over 20%. Yeah. Those are the kind of stocks we want to add to. 
Mm -hmm. you know? So sometimes we're adding for momentum, like end phase has momentum. And sometimes we're adding for valuation. So we yeah. do both. So there's, there's what's real cheap trade, you know, sort of like the value trade as we call it based off, like we don't consider a value stock just because it's oil or something. A value stock is one that trades below its growth rate, PE to growth rate. So yeah, you're, you're one of the uh, investment advisors, investment firm managers who has recognized and understood Tesla. You are uh, uh, by all terms, you're actually one of the best at this. You're well known for this and you're very articulate about this. Why is other investment firm managers not getting Tesla yet? How can they not get it? And when do you think they will? And do you see a big movement? And then the second question to that is, with all the other mega cap tech companies getting hammered, except for Apple, every one of them getting hammered big time, does that mean that there's going to be, there's a movement to Tesla when they see the earnings continue to just be monster earnings each quarter? Yeah, I mean, there's, to the second question, yeah, I think you'll see more rotation into Tesla from big cap tech investors yeah. as time goes on and they see the growth rates. Like Apple is a great holding, but the growth rate is supposed to be 5 to 10% a year and it's trading at 25 times earnings. So Apple's valued richly and it has a great future. But it's like, you know, how much money am I going to make on Apple? I'm going to make 10% a year, you know, mm -hmm. maybe 15 if I'm lucky, if they do something great. But, you know, the getting rich on Apple days are over. So, you know, as investors underperform, like the big cap tech investors underperform by not being overweight Tesla, then they all sell. Like, for example, Google, which is kind of like getting real boring yeah. and like by Tesla, you know, it just kind of makes sense. Right. So that's an easy trade. And, and we'll see more of that over time as investment managers, especially because the weighting of Tesla continues to grow in the S&P. So they have to, they mm -hmm. have to get Tesla, whether they like it or not. And then if Tesla, like lately, Tesla has been outperforming the market in the last month or two. Yes. And so that puts them further behind their benchmarks. And so, so they kind of have to buy Tesla, you know? Um, so there's part of that. Um, that's going on. So in my business, most investment advisors and brokers don't manage money. Okay. They farm it out. Mm -hmm. Most clients know this and they're paying two fees actually. And mm -hmm. so it's like, if you work at, with a guy at Merrill Lynch, for example, that person doesn't manage money. That right. person doesn't follow stocks. That person gets a mandate from their firm on what to sell that day. Mm -hmm. Like, structured products or loans. In this case, it's loans now, you know, it's like oh, sell yeah. loans. Now it's going to be hard for the bank because the interest rates are higher. You know, it's like, oh, it's hard to sell loans now. And, um, and then they like build these models that are basically like the dumbest, most basic portfolios you could ever imagine. In mm. fact, the money management at major, and we take this business every day. So I see the portfolios. Yeah. So clients come to us every day from these firms because we literally look at them and go, you're Broker sucks. Your advisors they do. They really like they do. Suck. They totally take advantage of you. They put yeah. you in some bunch of just proprietary funds and structured products and and broad indexes. You know, like you own every stock and every bond. And they don't want to take risk. And they don't mm -hmm. want to like. They want to be right in the middle because mm -hmm. in times like this, when we're underperforming because we're growth. It's like, oh, Ross sucks, and I suck one or two years out of a decade. <laughs> right. But the exactly. other eight, I kick ass, you know? That's right. And, and so it's like, you know, I do my best to less suck in those years, but it's really hard to time when those years are yeah. going to happen. And, yeah, and cool. you know, we don't suck less this year, for example, and it sucks. We're down 20%. That's mm -hmm. what it is. There has been nowhere to hide, actually. Even gold is down. So, yeah, it, you know, it kind of makes me feel better because there's been no trade that's worked. So everybody in the world's down. Everybody's down, yeah. But we're down a little bit more than we'd like to be because we're in growth. That's just the way it is. Most managers don't want to deal with that heat of like, oh, you're down 3 or 4% more than I should be this year. But in like... 2020 and 2021 and 2019, we outperformed by such a large amount that what I do with clients is I run a three-year report. I said, here's where you were pre-COVID and here's where you are today. And it's been a phenomenal run for us. So even though we're down 20%, we're up yep. an enormous amount from before COVID and clients go, okay, you're right. You know, we were due for a pullback. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So like, 
most investment managers just need to do exactly like everybody else so that they don't lose clients by taking risk, but they don't look at the upside of the taking risk because the way clients work is this, okay? This is the hardest part of my job. If you give me $100 and I make you $100, you say, hey, thanks. If you give me $100 and I lose you $10, it's like, what the fuck's wrong? Sure, sure, What's sure. Wrong? I'm losing all my money. <laughs> And I've also like, heard you mention the other one, which is if I had $100, you make me $100. And then next month it falls down to $80. Like, well, I'm going to go, hey. <laughs> so, that, that's like, so we call this behavioral finance, investment psychology. So the first investment psychology lesson that we'll teach you today. And <laughs> people are happy about the upside, but yeah. less expressive about it. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's not that they, they like and appreciate doubling their money, for example, but, and they might even say that's great or thank you. But if you lose anything, yeah, their risk tolerance is zero, you know, so they'll come in and say, buy me Tesla, Coinbase, you know, give me all the high octane stuff. Like this was last year, you know, middle of last year, give me everything you got. That's risky, you know? And we're like, yeah, you gotta be more conservative. Like, no, give me everything you got. That's risky. And we're like, you got to be more conservative, right? Market goes up through November. Everybody's like, ah, this is great. This is great. And then the market goes down and, and they're like, oh my God, I'm losing all my money. And I was like, well, yeah. exactly. You gave me a hundred dollars. Now it's $200. Right. And then now they're down to 150. And I'm then they're calling me going, I'm down 50 bucks. What the hell? <laughs> yeah, 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 it is. But that's why you're yeah, unique. Cause you kind of like thread Some that line between your growth. Yeah. They don't want to do that. They just want the smoothest path possible, even if it's about earning you 6% <laughs> a year instead of 10 in the S&P or higher, because the S&P has done even better than that over the last decade. They would rather get you half the return to avoid complaints and upsets and all right. this. Kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. There's a, you're, you're a growth guy, you're, you're, you're you've risk. invested in Tesla because you got it, but then you do need to temper it down because you are managing other people's money. Uh, yeah, and, and you don't want to lose well. See, that's the whole te Tesla yeah. thing. They'll yeah. buy, oh, put me all in a Tesla, then Tesla gets hammered, and they're like, what the hell's wrong with Tesla? Sure, and it's a beta <laughs> stock, so it's going to go fall much faster, but it's going to rise much faster too. So. Right, right. But people okay. who've been in Tesla forever don't care about the 50% declines because we, exactly. we all know that's part of it. But when people yeah. buy Tesla at 300 and they think yeah. it's just going to be the easy 30% return and then mm -hmm. it goes down 25% and they're like, oh, my God. And I go, don't worry. It'll take one minute. It'll be right back up. And then, boom, it pops right back up. You know, it's like the volatility is huge. And most mm -hmm. people are bad with volatility. So most advisors try to cut volatility as much as possible and have a consistent rate of return, even if it isn't going to get you to your goals. And what yeah. we tell our clients is that if you are in six percent a year on your assets for the rest of yeah, your life, I enough. guarantee you won't retire. Yeah. It's just impossible. So if you don't yeah. take some sort of financial risk, and what we try to do is make that a very minimal risk and limit those risks as much as we possibly can. Yeah. But there's going to be volatility when you invest with Gerber Kawasaki. But our goal is that you're going to make a return that gets you to your financial goals. Because if I guarantee you're not going to reach your financial goals, then what kind of advisor really am I? I'm a, li I'm a liar because I can run the projections and say you're not going to make it. Yeah. Well, OK. You know, it's, this is a, co a topic that we discuss all the time. We are Tesla investors, but we're also investors. And so we're trying to decide, you know, what amount of risk we're willing to take, right. no matter how excited we are with this company. But the good news, I think we're lucky, and you've said it many times, this is a once-in-a-generation company. Yeah. It's akin to an Apple, even maybe even better than an Apple opportunity. I think it's better than it, Apple. It's better than Apple. And it's going to be the best company in the world, the most consequential company in the world, probably the best investment in the world, but it will take decades to play out, and there's going to be huge volatility in between. Well, and so time, in your right? case, yeah. It's I'm going to live as well as the queen. I got plenty of time. <laughs> You got plenty of time. So do I. Okay. Right. Well, <laughs> you have, like you got plenty of time. What are you worried about? Right. Yeah. You buy some 
stock and it's good to get old. You're going to be rich. Well, well that's, I, am, I call myself a forever bull because I, I buy a stock, a generational company. I do go all in or, you know, I say all in, but vast majority of my net worth into this one company. And then I wait five to 10 years. And then my other friends are uh, momentum good. investors. And another one is in options. And I'm learning from each one of us. We're all learning from each other. And so, you know, but then I think what you said yeah, makes sense earlier, too, is you need to understand the psychology and you need to know what kind of person you are. Part of the reason why each of us have our own philosophies is because we have different makeups of people. What we what is gives us the most fear at night. Um, I'm more like you. I, I, I can you know, I'm more excited about the gains. But if I have a loss, I'm like, well, I shrub it off and move on. But other people, that loss is painful. Yeah, oh, some some people it's real painful for them to lose. But you know, I've I've done this my whole life, and I don't yeah. mean to discourage people who think they can make money trading or momentum. I was just on a show, and it was like a day trading show kind of thing, and I was like, "You guys are all young. Like, why are you day trading? Mm. It's like you're making me rich. You know, we trade against you. Like, don't you get it? Like, Wall Street trades against you. And I learned this lesson when I was a kid, and the first time I went to the New York Stock Exchange. And that was back when they had floor brokers. And, and this floor broker was taking me around. And this was the most incredible, illuminating day of my career at that time. It was 1999, top of the market. AOL it was just merging with Time Warner. Right. It was yes. insane on the floor <laughs> of the exchange. And I spent the whole day trading wow. with a floor broker. And he took me to this post where the guys type in the fastest I've ever seen a human type. And he said, and I said, what's he doing? He said, he's placing small trades. He's the guy who fills small, small trades. And he goes, let me tell you something. Everybody here. We're all multimillionaires. There's not one person on the floor of the exchange trading here that isn't a multimillionaire. All the people who are outside of this room, yeah. they're idiots. Mm -hmm. It's like, you don't want to trade against us. We're yeah. literally in the center of all the information. Yeah. Now think about it. It's worse today. You have one or two firms that control the entire stock market. It's Virtu and Citadel. Okay, so when I look at who buys my fund, it's Virtu and Citadel. Those are the only two people who trade with all these firms, right? So if you think you're trading against Ken Griffin and winning, you're just a delusional, confused person. Mm -hmm. Because Ken Griffin has just bought $900 million worth of real estate in the last three years, thanks to the public's trading of equities and options. Mm -hmm. Okay, you, you cannot make money this way over time. The way you make money is planting seeds, good seeds in your garden and tending to that garden. And over time, it will bear you lots of fruit, but it takes time and there's no other way. I'm sorry. Yeah. Flipping houses doesn't work either. You'll hear the story. Oh, my friend just flipped the house. My wife just came in. Oh, this guy I know just bought this house in Three Arch and sold it and he made a million dollars in six months. And I go, you know, we well, just bought our house here. And if I sell it in six months, we'll make a million dollars too. And we'll have nowhere to live. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's right. like, uh, the, those stories don't help anybody because it's not you and it's not going to be you. These are, nobody tells you about the story you tried flipping a house and then you end up losing 500 grand. Nobody yeah. tells that story. Yeah. Why would you? Well, yeah. let me tell you what I did. It was super dumb. I thought I could buy a house at the top of the market and I flipped it. <laughs> and Nobody's going to tell you that story. Yeah. So it's like, you can't look at your neighbors and your friends and listen to these fantastical stories of wealth. The statistics don't lie. 99% yeah. of people do not have a million dollars to invest. Yeah. 99%. So you can talk to 10 friends. They can all tell you they're doing a great thing. Well, I can tell you probably nine of those 10 are going to end up poor. Yeah. Yeah. Well, That's the way it is. I think we're very lucky. That's why we're saying. Yeah. Sit back and enjoy your life. Yeah. At the very beginning of this uh, interview, we were talking about the planting of the seeds, but you also talked about rising of the waves. Right. And we happen to be at this moment in time. I mean, uh, technology is just absolutely just mind boggling how fast it's changing. Yeah. We are here. We're lucky we found Tesla as one potential great company. And it's good that we're spending all this time. So, Thank you, Ross. Really appreciate you spending the time sharing your knowledge about Tesla and Tesla investors, the way we think, psychology and others. Uh, everyone, please follow Ross. He is on Twitter at, Ger at Gerber Kawasaki. He's got his website, GerberKawasaki.com. 
hopefully everybody got a little brighter today. That was my goal. And if you think you learned something new, uh, please uh, boop that like button. And I'm curious what kind of investor you are. If you're a forever bull like I am, if you're a, a momentum investor, if you're if you're an options trader, let me know in the comments. Thanks again, everybody. And thanks again, Ross. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it.